This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show looking at Saudi Arabia. The Chinese President Xi Jinping met Thursday with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman as the two countries move to increase economic ties. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., a federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit against Mohammed bin Salman for his role in the murder and dismemberment of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. The U.S. judge dismissed the suit, citing the Biden administration's recent granting of sovereign immunity to bin Salman. On Thursday, Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh and I spoke with Sarah Lee Whitson of Dawn, the Democracy for Our World Now. The group was a co-plaintiff with Khashoggi's fiancé in the U.S. lawsuit against the Saudi Arabian crown prince. I began by asking her about what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. I think starting with the murder uh, of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, all of the available evidence, including the UN Special Rapporteur's report uh, and the U.S. government's own report on the murder, uh, have documented uh, in great detail how uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman and uh, his agents uh, wooed Jamal Khashoggi from the United States uh, to travel to uh, Istanbul in order to try to obtain a marriage certificate there. Um, this this was the pretext to leading him uh, to the consulate, where murderous Saudi agents uh, tortured him uh, and murdered him. Of course, the Saudi government lied about torturing and murdering him uh, in the consulate uh, until overwhelming evidence, including video and audio recordings, uh, showed exactly um, what they did to him. Um, the CIA concluded that Mohammed bin Salman ordered um, the killing uh, based on uh, WhatsApp texts between him and Saud al-Qahtani, uh, both before and after the murder, uh, the use of Saudi state planes to transport the murders, uh, and, you know, the overwhelming uh, uh, evidence showing uh, that only he uh, could have ordered uh, this uh, atrocious act. Uh, our organization, Democracy for the Arab World Now, along with Khadija Jengis, brought the lawsuit in the United States uh, under the Torture Victims Prevention Act and the Alien Tort Claims Act, as well as state law claims claims in order to seek accountability uh, in a civil lawsuit uh, for this murder uh, and serving Mohammed bin Salman and two of his most senior agents uh, for this murder. Uh, now, the defendants, Mohammed bin Salman, Kahtani, and Asidi, immediately filed a motion to dismiss, uh, uh, seeking uh, uh, that the case be dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. Uh, but when the court would not rule on that, uh, uh, they turned to the Biden administration uh, to seek uh, intervention in the lawsuit. The Biden administration was not suggesting immunity, just as the Trump administration was not suggesting immunity. And this became a terrible bone of contention uh, between the Saudi government uh, and the Biden administration. Uh, the Saudi government uh, kept demanding uh, that MBS receive immunity in this lawsuit uh, and really just uh, uh, threatened to uphold uh, uh, oil uh, uh, production, uh, as well as not taking calls from President Biden, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, the golden uh, card uh, not uh, normalizing with Saudi uh, with Israel uh, until the Biden administration did what they wanted. Um, when, again, the Biden administration was not intervening days before the deadline uh, for them to intervene after the third delay, uh, the Saudi government issued a royal decree uh, temporarily appointing Mohammed bin Salman as prime minister instead of the king, um, which is what the basic law of Saudi Arabia provides, in uh, really an, a last-ditch ploy uh, to secure immunity as head of government. Uh, following this, um, the Biden administration did intervene in our lawsuit to suggest immunity for Mohammed bin Salman. And as you noted, this is what uh, the judge cited in his decision uh, to uh, dismiss the lawsuit against him. Um, uh, of course, we believe, as a matter of law and a matter of fact, uh, this was a fake manipulative ploy uh, to uh, title wash uh, himself with a bogus uh, title and bogus powers uh, as head of government, when we all know under uh, Saudi law, the king is the uh, only and absolute authority in the country. Um, but the Biden administration was hoping that Saudi Arabia would cut uh, would increase oil production rather than cut oil production, um, despite this massive concession by uh, the Biden administration, what did the Saudi government turn around and do? They reaffirmed oil cuts uh, in a, a very clear punishment 
uh, for the Biden administration, um, which was first announced ahead of the midterm elections, of course, uh, in a, a, a very transparent effort uh, to hurt the Biden administration and the Democratic Party uh, before the elections. And Sarah, just Sarah Lee, just to be clear, um, once MBS had been named uh, a prime minister, even though it's a nominal position, uh, would it have been possible for the U.S. not to have recognized him in that position and thereby denied him sovereign immunity, or was that uh, not an option? Well, uh, it was absolutely an option not to recognize this uh, uh, immunity ploy. Um, and I think we laid out very strong arguments, both as a matter of law and a matter of fact, um, that they should not recognize this phony uh, title, um, this phony effort uh, mere days before the deadline uh, for the administration to weigh in, uh, to come up with a title for uh, Mohammed bin Salman um, that formally, technically, is a head of government role. Um, they also could have just not weighed in at all. There was no obligation for the Biden administration to say anything. They could have remained mum on the matter uh, if it was just too politically difficult uh, and costly for them to weigh in. Um, but they chose not to do that. They chose uh, to voluntarily respond to the court uh, to suggest immunity for Mohammed bin Salman. Um, what we hoped, at minimum, was that they would just stay silent on the matter. Of and course, you say they, they didn't. And I just wanted to read that quote of Biden when he was running for president, uh, saying, we're going to make uh, them pay the price, make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. So at this point, um, has the case been dropped? Where do you go with your lawsuit, yours and Hatice Cengiz, the, um, the fiancé of the late Khashoggi? Well, um, obviously, uh, as with any uh, district court decision, we have the option to file an appeal uh, to the appellate court. Uh, and we are uh, consulting with our lawyers, as well as Khadija, uh, to determine what uh, will make uh, uh, the most sense. Uh, uh, because, quite frankly, uh, as a matter of law, when a, a, an administration suggests immunity uh, for uh, uh, someone as a head of government or head of state, uh, there's virtually no uh, willingness on the part of courts uh, to go against that. So it is a very, very uh, uphill and challenging uh, situation that we're in. Charlie, now if we could turn to the visit of a Chinese President Xi to Saudi Arabia, his meeting uh, today, Thursday, with uh, the Crown Prince. Uh, could you talk about what we know of what's emerged from those uh, meetings so far, what deals, what agreements have been reached? Sure. Um, the visit uh, uh, by uh, Xi follows, really, the last several years of deeply intensifying ties, uh, economic ties, but also military ties, uh, between Saudi Arabia and China. Uh, and um, this visit was meant to cap that off uh, uh, with the announcement of over $29 billion in deals in just the first day of Xi's visits, uh, in a dramatic expansion of uh, Chinese and uh, uh, Saudi ties. Uh, the military ties include uh, a factory to build uh, missiles. Um, that was something that was uncovered uh, earlier this year, uh, as well now as uh, efforts to uh, build a Saudi nuclear plant uh, for civil purposes um, that the Chinese are cooperating uh, with Saudi Arabia on. Um, you know, this is as important as this is economically, this is important politically. Uh, and as important it is politically, it's important symbolically, because this is Saudi Arabia sending a very strong and clear message to the U.S., to the Biden administration, um, that they will seek partners uh, and partnerships um, with China, that they will support Russia, that they are hedging their bets, that they will not rely on the United States for everything. The only thing they really want the United States for is for military protection. Uh, the only thing they need the U.S. to do is to really be a mercenary force, uh, one that's handsomely rewarded with massive military defense contracts, which was really the main thing that Biden achieved in his own visit to Saudi Arabia in July. Um, but that there is no uh, uh, political loyalty, there is no partnership, there is uh, nothing other than the U.S. serving as 
security guards uh, for Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think we all need to reorient our understanding that this is a position that the U.S. government and not just the Biden administration, but the Trump administration before him and the Obama administration before him have accepted. They have accepted the terms of their service agreement uh, with Saudi Arabia, and they have no uh, ability to show anything for it in terms of reciprocity uh, from Saudi Arabia for American interests. Sarah Lee, what is the nature of the security guarantees that Saudi Arabia seeks from the U.S., and, and security and protection from whom? Um, well, uh, uh, obviously, Saudi Arabia is a totalitarian state that uh, increasingly rules with absolute repression against its own citizens. Um, there are, of course, many decades of uh, uh, terrorist uh, incidents in Saudi Arabia that have threatened uh, the, the royal monarchy. Uh, and I think, first and foremost, it is to protect um, the uh, absolute monarchy that rules Saudi Arabia, and I think for decades has done so as a compliant partner for the United States. Um, what Saudi Arabia has demanded, which is exactly what the UAE has demanded from the U.S. government, are bilateral security agreements with NATO-level protections, which means that anytime Saudi Arabia comes under attack, uh, it will uh, be defended by the United States. Uh, of course, uh, there have been a number of very serious Houthi missile strikes on Saudi Arabia across the border for the past eight years, and deeper and deeper into uh, Saudi Arabia, including, of course, uh, uh, the infamous attack on the Abishek oil facility, uh, which significantly uh, hampered Saudi oil protection uh, production uh, uh, for a while. Now, the Biden administration has refused to give them that bilateral, actual uh, defense agreement, treaty-level uh, commitments and guarantees. But what the Biden administration did deliver uh, is a security umbrella, is an a aerial security security umbrella, uh, uh, along with uh, Israel, Bahrain, uh, Jordan, um, that basically uh, uh, assures uh, that the U.S. will protect uh, Saudi Arabia and a number of other states uh, from any aerial attack uh, defensively. Now, this is not the level of security guarantee that Saudi and UAE want, and this is why they continue uh, to yank on America's leash. Well, Sarah Lee, as you've uh, pointed out, of course, the situation with the, the U.S. Uh, uh, and Saudi Arabia has changed, also uh, with respect to the extent of uh, the U.S.'s dependence on Saudi Arabia for oil. Now uh, the U.S. gets very little of its oil from Saudi Arabia, whereas China uh, now gets the majority of its oil from Saudi Arabia. One of the issues that has reportedly been discussed in the talks uh, between Xi and uh, 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 MBS in Saudi Arabia has has been the question of whether some Saudi oil sales can be priced in yuan, in, in Chinese currency, rather than in U.S. dollars. What do we know about what has been discussed uh, on that issue and what the implications of that would be if Saudi oil could be uh, denominated in Chinese currency and not American mm -hmm. currency? Uh, I think there are two points. First, uh, to uh, the point you noted that the United States no longer depends on Saudi Arabian oil, uh, imports very little Saudi Arabian oil. Uh, I think what's important to understand is that uh, Saudi's uh, dominant role in OPEC means that it has a massive control over the price of oil globally, um, because this is set by the markets. Uh, and so even though the United States doesn't directly import a, a significant amount of oil from Saudi Arabia, it is dependent on the price of oil. And the uh, dramatically escalating oil prices in the United States are directly linked to what Saudi Arabia decides to do in terms of oil output uh, as part of OPEC. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, America is very concerned about oil prices uh, in Europe, and particularly uh, as part of the Ukraine war. So that has made the United States more dependent on Saudi Arabia to increase oil output, to keep the price of oil down globally. So this isn't just about what oil enters the United United States from Saudi Arabia, it's about Saudi Arabia's power over the price of oil globally, which is very, very important to the Biden administration. Uh, in terms of the discussions over pegging the price uh, to yuan, um, this is extremely significant um, because it would diminish uh, one of the main levers of control and influence of the United States uh, to have uh, the, the price of oil and the exchange of oil uh, cleared in dollars, uh, exchanged and represented in, in 
in dollars. To the extent that they move off of this dollar system and move to on, it's one more lever of independence uh, from what the United States can do to influence oil prices. Uh, and frankly, just to influence uh, global markets, because uh, first will come oil and repegging oil in non-dollar non currency, but then will come other assets. Uh, I think everyone should see um, that the recent uh, cap uh, on uh, Russian oil prices, this, this artificial made-up price for Russian oil, which is basically a reverse uh, 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 price fixing uh, to what OPEC does in fixing its oil, is something that is not just threatening to Russia, but is very, very threatening uh, to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, because they know that if this is something that the U.S. is doing to Russia today, uh, it can turn around and do it to them um, the next day. And I think so what you're going to see is China, Russia, and all of the OPEC states increasingly find ways not only to liberate themselves from the dictatorship of the dollar, um, but also liberate themselves in terms of shipping and insurance, which are the main levers that the U.S. and Europe are going to use to enforce uh, the price limit on Russian oil. Uh, uh, and so, in a, in a, in a weird way, in an you know, ironic way, perhaps, um, efforts to quash Russian oil production uh, uh, may well boomerang uh, into uh, increased uh, efforts to remove the influence and control uh, on global transactions, on global shipping, on global insurance um, that have been used to keep uh, or efforts to keep Russia uh, and other countries in line, um, because Saudi and the UAE see whatever the U.S. is doing to Russia, whatever Europe is doing to Russia, may well happen to them next from their yachts, from their properties all over the West, uh, and, of course, with the price of oil. Sarah Lee, could you also talk about um, the ex increasing uh, cooperation uh, between China and Saudi Arabia on uh, telecommunications, the fact that uh, China has been in discussions uh, on expanding both 5G and 6G telecommu uh, telecommunication networks uh, throughout Saudi Arabia, and why that's raising concerns uh, in the U.S.? Um, well, uh, uh, this is a you know a, a, a game of whack-a-mole because the United States has been trying to prevent uh, uh, countries around the world from signing 5G and 6G uh, deals with China because it would basically give them a complete uh, market control. Uh, um, but also intelligence and surveillance control over the networks, uh, uh, trans uh, communication networks uh, that they install, uh, build, and deliver. And of course, it's extremely, extremely lucrative um, and is a long term business investment. So uh, the United States thought it secured uh, commitments and agreements from Saudi Arabia in July not to develop 5G and 6G uh, with uh, China. Um, and that has not been mentioned as one of the deals. That they are announcing, um, but it is mentioned that it is something that they continue to work on. Um, but you know, this issue of 5G, 6G, it's something the U.S. has uh, faced and tried to challenge, not just with Saudi Arabia, but even with the United Kingdom as a major bone of contention, even with Canada. Um, this is uh, really China expanding and growing uh, its uh, ability to deliver the highest technology, but with that, the highest influence and control uh, over global communication networks, and this. This is why the United States uh, is uh, really, really concerned uh, about the expansion of Chinese 5G and 6G technologies. Sarah Lee, I want to end with the issue of Yemen. Uh, here in the U.S., over 100 groups have urged Congress Wednesday to vote for um, Bernie Sanders' uh, Yemen War Powers Resolution to end the U.S. backing for Saudi Arabia's war and blockade in Yemen. Um, Sanders said, he now has enough to support to pass the resolution on the Senate floor uh, and plans to bring uh, his measure to a floor vote as early as next week. Um, this is a, a, a very, very welcome development. Uh, I wish it wasn't so close to um, the next term of Congress, when it will be Republican-dominated, which I think will significantly stymie the ability to get this uh, resolution passed in, in, in the House of Representatives as well, um, uh, it is something that we're seeing because of the uh, uh, end of the truce in Yemen and the recommencement of uh, on-the-ground fighting, uh, and uh, extremely long overdue, as, 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 as viewers will remember, uh, Congress passed this War Powers Resolution 
resolution uh, to end U.S. support for the war in Yemen and end uh, uh, U.S. military transfers for the war in Yemen, intelligence sharing, uh, uh, military protection uh, for Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the war in Yemen, but Trump vetoed it. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, since we continue to be a participant in that war, uh, providing not just defense protection, uh, intelligence sharing, uh, but of course the, the uh, military equipment necessary to pursue this war, uh, uh, Senator Sanders is again trying to pass this war powers resolution. And because it is in the Senate, he does not need to get through committee in order to do that. Uh, it will be uh, interesting to see where the votes line up. Uh, in this moment of time, um, when the Biden administration has so dramatically capitulated uh, to the Saudi government and really doesn't want to do anything to upset the Saudi government because of this competition with China, because of its desire to maintain its uh, military uh, uh, and economic uh, influence uh, in Saudi Arabia, whether they will attempt to uh, uh, quash uh, even this war powers resolution in the Senate. Sarah Lee Whitson, executive director of Democracy for the Arab World Now, or DAWN. And that does it for our show today. Juan Gonzalez gives a speech at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies at 3 p.m. He'll be speaking about 50 years of defending and chronicling America's workers. On Monday at 6.30, he'll give an address on Latinos' race and empire at the CUNY Graduate Center. To see his first speech on reflections of 40 years of fighting for racial and social justice in journalism, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.